Hello, all. I want to welcome you back to uh, our, lect our lecture. Uh, today, we'll be starting with uh, our module 7. And we're going to start with introduction to solutions. So in this lecture, what do we intend to achieve? As usual, the stated objective is there. But before we look at the objective, let us see this quote. Uh, Cesar Chavez was a popular Latinx guy that fought for equality and justice. Um, and I like this quote about him. He believed in hard work, and most of his quotes are usually encouraging people to work hard. He said, there is no substitute for hard work, 23 or 24 hours a day, and there is no substitute for patience and acceptance. So in as much as we're going to keep working hard, we, always, we also notice that patience and acceptance, particularly when things are not done exactly the same way we want it, are, you know, are those stuff that help fuel successes along the lines. All right, so this is a good, a good quote you can think over. And uh, if you don't know about Cesar Chavez, he, left, he lived an interesting life. You can look it up at times as a sort of motivation. All right, let's take it off immediately. Now, what do we intend to achieve? There are two things we want us to achieve in this class at the end of the day. Number one, I'm going to be introducing solutions, and then we're going to be understanding some vocabulary related to solubility of uh, solutes in a in solvents and solutions. So we're going to understand um, everything about solutions. That's what, exactly what we're going to be doing today. We understand some terms that will help us do the second part by the time we begin to quantify this, our knowledge of solutions, begin to put it into problems. And two, we're going to understand how solutions occur. What is the cardinal rules? What's the relationship between when a polar solvent interact with a non-polar solute are they actually going to dis dissolve and those are the things we intend to achieve in this class let's take it off immediately from there a solution of course we introduced solution earlier in the introductory class a uh, solution is a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances of course um a solution there are most of the matter we see around us are solutions it is solutions or, or, or compound it is very rare for things to actually occur pure in our environment, except those things that occur as just pure uh, compounds themselves. But usually, most of these things will come in mixtures, and now we will now begin to separate them to clean them up. So a solution itself is a mixture of those two substances. It can be colored or transparent. We usually have most uh, clear or transparent solution, but it can also be colored. And the particles of the liquid are too small. You can't see the particles of the liquid, and even the solid as well. And they're always in constant motion, and that is the reason why it does not settle down. When you have your salt and water mixture, let's say salt and water, you put them down, or your salt and your sugar come only around here. You don't different. You can't differentiate between the particles of water and the sugar because you just see a clear solution of salt water, and because both of them are so fast moving around that they will never settle down under the influence of gravity. Of course, the physical state of a solution depends on the physical state of the solvent. I think the reason why that happens is because the solvent is the majority component. Of course, every solution is a mixture of a solute plus a solvent. Now, the solvent is the guy, is the majority component. The majority component would decide the overall state because it is small, and the solute is usually the minority component. It, it's the minority component. So this is basically what I tell myself. This is how you, if I ask what is the solution, and you can give me this, that makes a lot of sense. So I already talked about a solvent. A solvent is a substance that is present, of course, in the largest amount. And determines the overall state. Like I said, it determines the overall state. It determines the physical state of the solution. Because it's is the guy at the largest quantity. The same majority carries the vote. So it is the majority and it carries the vote at the end of the day. So the solute is the substance in a small amount, less than the solvent. Of course, a solution can contain more than one solvent. So if you see a solution, you must have only one solvent, but more solute. So a solution can contain more than one 
solute. I mean to say not a solvent, more than one solute. So you can it but what matters is that there will always be one solvent. Every other content has to be a solute. So it doesn't matter. Just like the air we breathe, air we breathe contains air we breathe contains uh, a lot of gases. But in all of them, nitrogen is the greatest, and nitrogen is solvent, and every other one will remain the solute. So solution of course forms when two or more solute dissolve in a solvent. And which are common examples of the things we're gonna see. I've talked about salt water. Salt water is a good solution. Salt water contains, of course, what does it contain? It contains salt, which is sodium chloride. I can just be specific. Let me just be specific. It contains sodium chloride plus water. If I say sugar solution, it contains sugar plus water as well. So air, even air will breathe, of course. Air, what does air contain? Air contains, okay. In air, we know that air contains the solvent there, the guy in largest amount is actually nitrogen. Nitrogen, oh, let me say N2, that's shorter. Nitrogen, whereas other guys, the solute. So the solute could be, the other guys are the solute, and oxygen is there. The noble gases, noble gases are all there in small amount, and a couple of other ones inside again. So now, other ones include, now, you know, a solution can also call, this is where students usually get it at times, they don't understand, they tell them that alloys are mixtures of metal and non-metal. So for a good example too, if you see bronze, bronze is a solid, solid, a solid, solid solution. In this case, now this one is solid liquid solution. In this case, salt water, solid liquid. This one is gas, gas solution. Now, bronze is solid, solid solution. So bronze itself is made up of copper and tin. And in fact, copper itself is the solvent and tin is the solute because it contains in a less amount. The same thing goes for steel. Steel we use every day. Steel contains carbon and iron. So iron actually is the solvent Therefore, carbon here is going to be the solute. So these are all solid, solid, solute, solid, solid solution. So it doesn't matter. A solution can be in any state. So a solution can be can be in any physical state. It doesn't matter. What matters is what is the physical state of the solvent. It can be solid. It can be liquid. It can be gas. What matters is that it has to assume the state of the solvent. All right, let's move it on from the solubility. Solubility is just a measurement, quantitative measurement of the amount of a particular solute that can be dissolved in a particular solvent. How much of this solute can dissolve in a particular solvent? And that gives us that there are three ways to use this solubility vocabulary. A soluble substance is any substance that will dissolve to a significant extent. In fact, when uh, sodium chloride dissolves in water or when sugar dissolves in water it dissolves completely in a very significant amount that you cannot even separate the two of them so if you look at this my container here now this is a mixture of let me call this one sugar let me call this one sugar solution now or glucose solution in this case glucose is mixed with water completely mixed you cannot even use your, you cannot see it and say okay you know that there is glucose in this solution because it is so homogeneous now an insoluble substance is a substance that will dissolve will not dissolve to a significant extent there could be particle there could be a relationship of dissolution but it is not perfect a good example is what you see in chalk chalk water if i don't want to call it chalk water i can say calcium carbonate plus water now calcium carbonate of course it's or carbonate. Remember when we did about solubility with carbonate. Are, carbonates are usually insoluble, so it, it will only form a kind of suspension. It doesn't completely dissolve completely because it is insoluble in water. However, now you use the word immiscible to refer to two liquids that cannot dissolve each other. When two liquids cannot interact each other, fact, one of the liquid will be polar, one of them will be non-polar. Example: If you see what we have here, what we have here is what is if you mix water. And oil, let's say vegetable oil. Water is polar, vegetable is non-polar. They cannot mix each other. Now the oil is so you see, oil is light, it settles above, it settles above uh, above water while water goes down. And you see this bubbles telling you that these two guys cannot mix because they cannot interact. Water is highly polar, 
So oil is non-polar. Whereas water itself is polar. Now, pol non-polar and polar cannot interact. What are going to give us, if that both of them are liquid, they're going to give us an immiscible liquid. So this is exactly, so when you say a liquid is immiscible with another liquid, that is what we mean. So when we consider th this degree of saturation, we can see a relationship in solubility. This degree of solubility can be shown in what we call the solubility curve. The solubility curve is a curve of the solubility of different substances in water with respect to temperature. Now, is easy. Now, for solid, increase in temperature will increase the solubility for solid. For solid and liquid. However, this is different for gases because gases will begin to decrease as we increase their solubility. Let's see what is happening here now. Now, this is potassium ion that is a solid. As temperature is increasing, because temperature is going from 0 to 100, the distance begins to increase. See, this is a slope. This slope shows you there's an increase in as there's an increase in solubility here from about 130 begins to go to 150 the more temperature is increased you look at sodium nitrate the same pattern is seen here now if you, if you look at potassium nitrate you will see this exponential curve that the moment you increase the temperature the, the the solubility jumps up so high exponentially that it begins to increase now the same thing happens to ammonium chloride and most solid will always show you this pattern however let's look at the gases this is ammonia gas now the solubility at this point is about 90 90 grams and 100 grams of water the moment the temperature begins to increase what happens you see it begins to fall begins to fall begins to fall and at, the, at 100 degrees celsius it becomes almost very very low and almost begin to get become so insoluble so that's exactly what happens now let's look at another gas that will do that too the hydrogen chloride gas look at it the same thing is happening here is also decreasing as you go down look at the so2 2 so2 gas as well so if you look at all these gases the pattern is that as the solubility as the temperature increases the solubility begins to increase so that is why i have here i said solubility of solid and gases solubility of solid oh, this is sorry oh my bad this is solubility of solid and liquid increase with increase in temperature why the gases would decrease with decrease in temperature so it's important please you're going to Correct this thing in your lecture note. I uh, this um, I mean to be liquid at this point. All right, thank you. Um, degrees of saturation. Now, of course, saturation measures how much of a solute that will dissolve in a particular solvent at a particular temperature. Just like we talk, it's also a kind of measurement of solubility. That's exactly at this solubility is a kind of measurement of solubility. So now, an unsaturated solution is a solution that contains just less than the amount of solute that it can contain. It contains less than the maximum. You see, every sol when you get a particular so a quantity of solvent and a particular quantity of solute, and you now begin to add your solute into your solvent, it's going to be, even when both of them are very polar, like a, like a good example, a polar salt and water, which is polar, they'll be mixing. At the point, you find out that the solubility of that particular solvent can be overwhelmed depending on the number of solute you begin to add into it. So for a saturated solution, is a solution that contains, it, it is still less than the maximum amount of that solute that it can contain. So in this case, this is like a perfect solution because it, if, the more, if you still add some solute, it's going to dissolve it comfortably without having a problem. However, at the point, if you keep adding, you're going to reach what we call a saturated solution. In saturated solution, it, uh, it now contains the maximum amount of that solute that can dissolve at that particular temperature. So any addition of more of this solute will begin to result to undissolved solute and to begin to be unstable. So if you add more and more, it will now move to supersaturated solution, which actually means that in this solution now, it contains greater than the amount that is supposed to dissolve at that temperature. And how do you actually make it? You just make this by increasing the temperature of the, the, the condition of the solution high so that it can contain enough solute as possible so it contains the great, greater than the amount of solute that can be dissolved at that temperature it is an unstable solution and the solute will usually begin to crystallize especially when you disturb it how do you prepare this like i said earlier you prepare this by by setting up the temperature very high at the high temperature and cooling the solution so you get a saturated solution like you get the one you have here already if you form the saturated solution at high temperature and then what do you do you begin to cool it 
And the moment you cool it below that temperature, you're going to begin to see crystals crystallize and begin to see that. So this is exactly what you're going to see. So a saturated solution, sorry, unsaturated solution is a perfect mixture whereby the solvent still contains less than the maximum amount of solute that it can retain at that particular temperature. Now, as you begin to add more solute at a point, you're going to go to a point, point whereby the solution is beginning to be saturated. If you want it to be saturated, you have to stop at that point, at that temperature. However, if you get this saturated solution and decrease the temperature or add some more solute, it's going to begin to seed out completely. And everything is going to seed out and form solid. And in this case, we say we have a super saturated solution. Now, the solution process. A solution so process simply means the intimate interaction between solvent molecules and the solute particles. Now, the effective rule of thumb is, is usually that likes will dissolve likes. I said this thing in our module 4 when we talked about polarity. Like will dissolve like. Polar solvent like water will dissolve polar solute. Um, will dissolve polar solute and ionic solute. Ionic solute is like those ones that have ionic bond, like those that have metal and non-metal in them. Polar ones are those ones that will have the ion, the, the, the dipole-dipole interaction in them that are very much polarized. Whereas, on the other hand, non-polar solvent will dissolve non-polar or non-ionic solute. Solute will not dissolve in any solution. If, number one, remember, for a solute to dissolve in a solvent, there has to be this intimate interaction, whereby the solvent, which is the majority component, we get into the bonds of this solute, rip them apart, and make sure that there is a homogeneous mixture. So, first is, solute will not dissolve in, in a solvent. If, number one, let's see what condition forces between the solute particles are too strong to be overcome by the interactions with the solvent particles. If they are too strong, that the solvent cannot get into there and then overcome it, there won't be any solution. And then, if solvent particles to themselves are not free enough themselves, they are too strongly attracted to each other, they are not free to allow the solvent come in contact with them and have that intimacy to form a homogeneous mixture, there won't be any solution at all. So if you look at what is happening here now, like a good example here. So if this is, let's say, my sodium chloride being dissolved in water, water in a cup, you begin to mix them up. Now the solute is coming and the solvent is coming. What is happening here now? The solvent should be able to get into the solute, rip it apart, and now have... So this, what we have here is a homogeneous, is a homogeneous mixture. That's exactly what we have there. Let me... Say homogeneous mixture. So they should be able to get into one another and interact seamlessly. And that is what you have in here. So here now I have a very good homogeneous. So this this is the homo. Remember, a solution has to be homogeneous. It must have to be homogeneous for it to be a solution. Homogeneous solution so this is exactly what you have here so when they mix each other that they can get into each other interact seamlessly and intimately that is exactly what gives you a perfect homogeneous solution now that will take us to this now remember we're going to apply some residual knowledge that we had in the earlier modules about polarity and how water dissolves polar and non-polar molecules. it says using the diagram of free molecules show and depict how water water is a polar solvent we dissolve the following. Remember, you remember the Lewis structure of water? We're going to see how it is going to dissolve these guys. How will, how will that happen? Remember, for first of all, this is an ionic compound. This is a polar compound. Ionic compound, first of all, will be hydrated individually by water molecule. Let's see what happens there. Remember, potassium chloride will first of all be ripped apart into potassium ion plus chloride ion. That's the first thing that is going to happen. So you're going to have water here. So this is aqueous and this is aqueous. So water is going to hydrate individually the two ions in potassium ion. So let's start with the first one. So if I start with my potassium ion, how will water hydrate it here? I hope I'm going to have enough space to do this. I have to move the space a little bit longer towards the side. Uh, okay. But I'm going to fit it in. So what is it going to be? For? Let's see. Let me do potassium. So for potassium ion, the negative side of water will surround it. So it's going to be this way. Remember, we did this thing in module 4 when we talked about polarity of molecules and intermolecular forces. Because in fact, the kind of force going on here is what we call 
iron dipole iron dipole that is what this one is dipole dipole interaction that is exactly what we have so this is what we're gonna get for this now i'm gonna use a different let me use my blue to make those interactions again you see now this is partial negative this is partial negative this is partial negative this is partial negative interacting with the positive side remember hydrogen is a partial positive but i'm not going to put all of them so water now is hydrating in the the sodium ion individual let's go back and go back to my color then what about the chloride i'm going to put the chloride there so now the chloride on its own will be hydrated by the hydrogen molecules facing it remember this is negative here and i use this to put my this here okay yeah this is what you're gonna get and then remember this is partial negative but remember this is partial positive partial positive every hydrogen is partial positive and this is partial negative so this is actually what is happening at that point so this is how water will hydrate or interact with this now what about ammonia ammonia is a polar molecule the lewis structure of ammonia is this let's see this is the lewis structure of ammonia it has hydrogen remember ammonia is polar by virtue excuse me ammonia is polar by virtue of its trigonal pyramidal structure remember it has a lump here so now what are we going to interact remember hydrogen here is partial positive so it's going to interact with negative here which is the water the oxygen of the water here now this one we go this is negative negative so it's going to go to another hydrogen this way this is exactly what we're going to have and then when i use my different colors to put this partial negative partial positive partial positive positive partial positive partial okay let me put that one this is partial negative all oxygen all oxygens are partial negative all hydrogens are partial positive so this is how you do this problem and this is a reminder of what we did in the previous models because i already tell you the knowledge of chemistry and teaching is usually something cumulative that you need to keep carrying over from one concept to another let's go to problem two again now you see if you look up by my side i showed you the solubility table that we also used when we did in, uh, reactions and types of reactions and solubility of some ionic products so i brought this thing here because you're going to see some um ionic compounds here too and look at use the solubility table to figure out whether they're soluble and what now the first one says hydrogen fluoride gas in hexane if you look at the structure of hydrogen fluoride it is a polar molecule HF. Remember, fluorine is the most electronegative element. And hydrogen is also in the middle. So hydrogen fluoride is a highly polar compound. But it's, when you dissolve it in hexane, which is non-polar, remember we said the cardinal rule, polar dissolves in polar, non-polar dissolves in non-polar. What it means is that a polar cannot dissolve in non-polar. And the solubility here is going to be what? It's going to be insoluble. These two cannot dissolve each other. Because this is polar versus non-polar nitrogen gas in water again now nitrogen of course remember nitrogen itself n2 has a lewis structure of this so and by virtue of this symmetrical nature and being the atomic most the atomic molecules are not a non-polar so as a result this molecule is non-polar and because it's non-polar it cannot dissolve in water that is polar that is the reason so it remains insoluble calcium carbonate in water now can you remember to figure out the solubility of any compound we will do that with the help of the solubility table when you look at carbonate let's look at the carbonate it says all carbonates are insoluble except ammonia and group one and there's no group one here because calcium is in group two what that simply means is that this is going to be insoluble so this is going to be insoluble in water if it had been a group one element or ammonia would have said this is soluble potassium phosphate in water remember all put if you look at this all put all phosphates are insoluble except group one and ammonia 
for that means in group one what that simply means is that this is going to be very soluble in water it's going to be soluble in water it's going to be soluble in water and the last we're going to do here but not the least this is benzene benzene is non-polar and in carbon tetrabromide if you draw the Lewis structure of carbon tetrabromide it's going to look this way carbon tetrabromide is a symmetrical molecule remember a molecule that has the same thing attached of and most symmetrical molecule will make it what non-polar because it's non-polar and you have benzene so benzene is going to dissolve so non-polar is going to dissolve in non-polar therefore what you're going to have here is that benzene will be soluble will be soluble in carbon tetrabolomide so what i'm going to do here is just put solo because both of them are non-polar and that is how you do this kind of problems now how do we increase the dissolving rate of a substance there are so many ways we can can do so the ability in dissolving rate, what you tend to achieve is either you, you reduce the surface of the solute and make it to interact more with the solvent or you can increase temperature that's basically the commonest thing or increase the mechanical or physical properties so good example now the first thing is that when you crush or grind a solute you're providing a larger surface area for the solvent to attack and this will help you to dissolve more rapidly that's why when you cook you want to heat you want to like you know macerate your food and reduce it and crush it and do everything because you want when you're cooking it you want it to, to actually mix well and for it to cook well to heating heating increases the temperature so this simply means increase in temperature and when temperature increases what happens is that the molecules of the solute and the solvent begin to move fast and collide with one another and with more frequent collisions there will be what increase in dissolution rate and lastly but not the least is steering steering rap rapidly does what helps you to increase the speed of the particle of solute and solvent so that they can mix well each other and this also helps and it helps even when you have a saturated solvent and you begin to mix them very well, it allows it to what? To unsaturate so that it will mix properly. So stirring and agitation is also needed for it to increase the dissolution rate of a substance. Let's now go to the second concept we need to talk about here, the colloid. Now colloid looks a little bit like the colloid looks a little bit like the solutions but they're not the same we're going to see the difference it's also a homogeneous mixture of two or more components but in this case the dispersed substance is present in the largest amount than the found in solution now the solute of the solute of the colloid which we call the dispersed substance the dispersed substance is the solute of the solvent now it's actually larger than those of the solution in fact it could be in a region of one to one thousand nanometer again let me say the you now the dispersion medium a colloid i can just say this way colloid simply means dispersion medium this person or you can say dispersion medium medium plus dispersed phase that's exactly so in this case we don't use the solute and the solvent anymore so dispersed medium simply means the majority component which is analogous to solvent in solution and the dispersed phase simply means the solute that kind of thing because the one that is what in the minority, the minority component and which we can say it is analogous to solute in solution now good at the properties it cannot be seen with the eye it does not settle under gravity both of these two properties are also shared by what they are shared by so they are shared by solution however it does scatter light it can scatter and reflect light in fact the, the part of light through it can be visible that is the difference between uh, 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 a solution and a color so if you look at this now the first thing we have here is a solution and you see the part of light in this this is a solution and this is what a color if you look at it now the flashlight here light passed through this you couldn't even see the part of light here but if you look at this you begin to see the part of light so the part of light you see here is what separates a colloid from a solution that the solution rather like I said the, co the colloid undergoes what we call this pa particular effect is what we call the tidal effect and the last thing we're going to consider here but not the least is to look at a table that I just made for you to consider all the properties of this solution very interesting table so here we have the property 
we have the solutions colloid and suspect so in particle size the solution is very small now this measurement is in nanometer this is from 0 0.1 to 1 very small the colloid is between 1 to 1000 whereas the suspension is greater than 1000 now filterable with ordinary filter paper filter paper cannot filter filter this because the particles are so small of them are going to pass through the same thing with the color however for suspension you can filter out the solids and then the liquid is going to pass the solvent homogeneous now this homo ho homogeneity solution is very homogeneous uh, this can be homogeneous or a little bit not is in the middle is a little bit whereas the suspension is never homogeneous at all now settles on standing the solution cannot settle on standing it cannot settle under gravity color cannot settle whereas suspension can easily settle under gravity a good example i tell you if you look at the mixed magnesium trisilicate you use for acidity when you keep it in the freezer you find that that thing goes down and settles and stays there now interaction with light solute is very transparent like we saw in the tidal effect now the colloid here undergoes the tidal effect is not suspension is completely opaque and some of them some of them that are a little bit smaller can undergo tidal effect but or completely opaque majority component the majority component of a solution is called the solvent for the colloid is called a dispersing medium for the suspension is also a dispersing medium the minority component of solution is a solute here it is called the dispersed phase here it is also called the dispersed phase good examples uh, this is salt water here minus is a very good example of a colloid and here chalk water is a good example of a suspension and, and the last thing seen with the eye you cannot see anything here you cannot see anything here as this one clearly you can see so if you see a chalk water like i showed you earlier when we talked about uh, um, when we talked about miscible and insoluble if somebody saw chalk water the chalk is going to just settle down and it's clear you can see it there and it can even decant it easily and then I'll let it settle under there so these are the summary i would say this is the summary of all the uh, properties of those mixtures that we need to know thank you once again for listening and do have a wonderful day bye at this point